Hey, hey, not casters. Well, actually, you're not the not casters. I'm the not caster. Happy Christmas and a Merry New Year. Today is uh, Christmas Eve, and I'm going to be talking about obscure 80s Christmas movies. That is movies set at Christmas that you might not realise are set at Christmas. So if you're like me and you're very bar humbug uh, and uh, you don't like Christmas at all, even though you've got the beard, but not the, the red hat, um, you might think, oh, I want to watch a movie that's set at Christmas. At least, you know, be vaguely interested in the season, but not the obvious Christmas movies. Then I've got some suggestions for you that you can watch over the next few days when you're off. Uh, obviously, if you're watching this in the middle of June, make a list of these recommendations and hold them back. And I've tried to restrict it to movies from the 80s because I know a lot of films from the 80s that were set at Christmas that weren't strictly Christmas films, which means I am going to have to cheat. Uh, first and foremost, I'm going to tell you what's not in the list. OK, so um, there isn't going to be Gremlins because that's pretty obviously a Christmas movie. It's set at Christmas. It's got a storyline where people dress up as Santa's. It's, it, I mean, if you don't know it's a Christmas movie, you've never seen the film. It's pretty obviously a Christmas movie. So that's not exactly a great big gotcha. The second one I'm not going to mention, which comes from the 80s, is Planes, Trains and Automobiles. Because that is literally about a guy trying to get home from the Christmas holidays. Yes, we all know it's a Christmas movie. The third one, which I'm not going to mention from the 80s. Everybody knows this. Everybody works with a guy in the office goes, Did you know Die Hard is a Christmas movie? I bet you didn't know that, did you? Well, everybody knows it's a Christmas movie because every Christmas there's an article somewhere on the internet that goes, did you know Die Hard is a Christmas movie? So I'm not going to mention that. Also, the line, ho, 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 I have a machine gun is pretty bloody obviously uh, a Christmas thing. I mean, obviously, um, Die Hard films are wonderful. Uh, this box set features um, the three good films and the two fan fiction ones made later on, which are deeply disappointing, uh, including... Um, John McClane Punches the Internet, also known as Die Hard 4, and uh, Death to the Ruskies, also known as Die Hard, A Good Day to Die Hard, which are both awful movies, but of course you can't get the three without getting the four, so there you are. Somewhere there is a fan edit of Die Hard 5 that doesn't suck, but I don't think there is, somehow. I'm also not mentioning films from other decades, by the way, with one notable exception, which means from the 70s, you don't get a couple of obscure movies which were set at Christmas, which you may not know about. The Andromeda Strain was set at Christmas. It's pretty good, actually, directed by Robert Wise, and Three Days of the Condor. Quite why I have got a French version of this, I don't know, um, but I do. Uh, and that is a fantastic little spy thriller with Max von Sindow, uh, Sindow everyone's favourite um, exorcist, um, set at Christmas as well. There's also going to be a, couple, a film from, uh, from the 90s and a couple from the 2000s I'm not going to mention because they fall outside of our target bracket. The second best Schwarzenegger Christmas film, End of Days. I will tell you at the end what the first best one is. Obviously it's set Christmas, New Year's Eve, 1999. Uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. This is a fabulous film, which I think is set at Christmas again. And uh, that is uh, obviously by Shane Black. Almost all of his films, apart from Predator, are set at Christmas. And finally, In Bruges, uh, the fabulous movie, which was also set at Christmas, but came out in 2008, so doesn't apply. I'm also not mentioning 1974's Roger Moore movie, Gold. And the reason I'm not mentioning it is because it wasn't made in the 80s, it was made in 1974. Now, Gold hinges on a fabulous plot device, which is a booby trap Christmas present to blow somebody up. That's not a spoiler, but it is made in 1975 or 1974, so it doesn't really apply as a Christmas movie. So instead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, I'm going to go chronologically from the first movie uh, to 1990, uh, and that's um, 10... 10 movies made in the 80s, plus one honourable mention. The honourable mention goes to this little-known and uh, spectacularly poorly-aged mercenary men-on-a-mission movie called The Wild Geese. Uh, it's pretty much on television every day in the Christmas period, probably on ITV4. It's probably showing in about half an hour, actually, on ITV4. And it's one of those films that most definitely would have the title beforehand going, this film may reflect the outdated social attitudes and values of the time during which it was produced. It's, I saw it relatively recently, and it's, a, it's an interesting men on a mission movie in the same kind of approach of things like Guns of Navarone 
or um, you know, all, uh, all those type of films, where it's a bunch of guys that are off to do a thing. Except this time, they aren't there to overthrow the Nazis. They're there to overthrow a country. Uh, uh, a, um, oh, let me just quickly check. Um, a remote and hostile corner of Africa. Change in nation's destiny. Seize the airport and make their escape is according to this, which means it has some unenlightened attitudes towards Africa and Africans, and it also has some uh, quite dodgy moralising. It's totally okay to pervert the course of justice or to overthrow a democracy or a dictatorship. Uh, and by the way, they also need to seize the airport. Not that you've ever tried to overthrow a country, at least I suspect you haven't, but should you ever need to do so, one of the first things you need to take is the airport to prevent the head of state leaving the country and making off with all the money, by the way, in case you ever need to form, uh, put, implement a revolution in, in another country. Or well, please, please don't do it. HR would get involved. They would be concerned. So don't try and overthrow any democracies uh, on the basis of any advice that I'm giving you during the course of this episode. Secondly, Wild Geese is set at Christmas. You may not think it is, but it is, because uh, Richard Harris's character... Um, here, uh, possibly uh, at least half of the cast on the front were raging alcoholics during the time that this film was being made. Uh, Richard Harris's character, whose name is uh, un unidentified on the back of the box, um, was was uh, said, "I'll be back in time for Christmas." To his son, uh, doing one last mercenary mission, like a lot of films, one last mission, three days from retirement. Uh, which all, of course, goes tragically, horrifically wrong because it never goes horrifically right, does it? And secondly, um, it uh, he never he doesn't come back in time for Christmas, so the guy doesn't get any Christmas presents. Wild Geese is also where Roger Moore was trying to expand his vocabulary cinematically during the James Bond years uh, and made a, a drug dealer eat a pile of cocaine. Uh, because that's how the 80s, or more correctly, the 70s worked. But in many, many ways, The Wild Geese is both a film that, that straddles the 70s and the 80s, because it feels kind of 80s-ish, but it also feels very 70s at the same time. And it came out in 1978. So I'm going to give it a pass here. The Wild Geese was set at Christmas. It's a Christmas movie. If your idea of a Christmas movie is hairy old blokes that pretended that they fought in the Second World War doing mercenaries, then sure, this is for you. If you don't like films that are a bit dodgy, that have bad social attitudes uh, and unenlightened attitudes to anybody that isn't a white straight male, then this is probably not the film for you. And to be fair, it's not a particularly good film. I enjoy it, but I watch it now and I enjoy it from the point of view that I was once five years old watching it on television going, oh, it's quite good, isn't it? And when you're five years old in the 80s, you don't necessarily think too much about anything too much. Whereas obviously when you're 50 years old in the 2020s, looking at certain things and going, yeah, it's aged like milk. Talking of another film that is aged by milk, this is also a Christmas movie. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Steven Spielberg's Christmas movie, which you may not know, depending upon who you talk to and when it came out, either 1979 or 1980, Spielberg's first flop, 1941. This is the American DVD release of it. It's been... Um, quietly uh, kind of removed from public circulation. So it exists, but it's not exactly common or often thought of. This film is set Christmas 1941 in the immediate aftermath of the Pearl Harbor attacks. And uh, it's, um, it's a film where, where you can see they're doing everything, all the inputs are working, but the outputs aren't working. The magic isn't there. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just not particularly good. It's a kind of attempt to reproduce the feeling of a screwball comedy from the 60s something like it's a mad 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 world i think that's 12 mads but it doesn't work it doesn't succeed and it sounds like a hollow imitation it's not it's not screwball it's not it's imitation in 72 hours or 72 three years it's going to take over the world but it's not very good it's one of my least favorite of my spielberg movies i've seen them all uh, over the years, um, and it's just not very funny. It also relies on a lot of slapstick. I think slapstick is the uh, one of the lowest forms of comedy up there with Michael McIntyre and Mrs. Brown's Boys. Um, so I'm going to go for the third film uh, in my in my ten from the eighties. Uh, film set at Christmas that you may not realise are set at Christmas. This is one that has probably passed you by. The lovely, warm, heartwarming 
festive, cheery fun that is First Bloods. Uh, Sylvester Stallone's probably singular best on-screen performance, apart from possibly Copland, First Bloods is set at Christmas. A great play. Uh, now, you may not necessarily realise this, but there are Christmas trees all over the place in the film, especially in the police headquarters that gets uh, slowly exploderated at the end of the film. Uh, I also have the, um, the David Morrell book here, upon which the film was based, uh, which I bought for £3.49. Absolute bargain, to be honest. And the film here, this is the American Blu-ray that has loads of extras on it. First Blood is a, a great film, actually. I really uh, rate it highly. It's probably the only film I've seen that has a realistic portrayal of, of, of a nervous breakdown on screen right at the end of the film. And um, it's, a, it's a very strange and unusual film. Not what I was expecting at all, actually, because you think after Rambo and uh, Rambo First Blood 3, and then the appalling Rambo and... 2000 and whatever's last blood which is just a misogynistic racist stupid piece of shit um first blood is surprisingly good uh, and I, I really rate it it's probably one of my favorite of, of stallone's films he's ever made doesn't mean it's necessarily easy it's a bit of a cock fest as well and by that what i mean it's a very man movie you know it's about men with feelings and i think there's like only two women that have any speaking parts in the film as well really fails the bechdel test completely um, and if you don't know what the bechdel test is it's where two women have a conversation in a movie about something that isn't a man by the way uh, so there you go but first blood definitely fails the bechdel test but that's that's also a precursor to ho 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 now i have a machine gun a nice happy christmas movie for you um Okay, so we're going to go for a couple of others here. Uh, we're going to go for um, Trading Places. Again, a film that would have to have at its, uh, at its start a little bit of text to say that it reflects the contemporary social attitudes and values of the time during which it was made. It has aged very, very poorly. I mean, it's a very good film, actually. Uh, but, oh my word, there's a, there's a lot of very unacceptable words in there. There's uh, quite a lot of, of, of random and gratuitous nudity. There's quite a few racial stereotypes, um, including, uh, by the way, portrayals of uh, racial stereotypes that are very negative towards the people that hold those racial stereotypes. It's that kind of thing where you go, well, in order to portray a certain form of racism correctly, you have to show exactly how horrible and stupid it is, which is in this film. But that doesn't excuse some of what's happening in this film. At the point is, I was 10 years old when this came out. I watched it on television as a 14-year-old. I thought, that's very good. Look, it was 1987. I was 14. Um, I hadn't spoken to a woman that wasn't either one of my friend's sisters or somebody who worked in a shop or my mum for something like three years uh, because I was a shy, retiring, introverted child. Uh, I had little understanding of how the real world worked, but possibly slightly more of an intuitive understanding than Trading Places did. This is has aged poorly, but it is a Christmas film. It's set at Christmas. And if you want to watch a film set at Christmas, but you don't necessarily, is fully Christmas orientated it's not like a love actually or santa claus the movie or deck the halls or whatever this is a good one to watch during christmas as long as you remember the 80s was a terrible time for social attitudes talking of terrible social attitudes by the way here is a, a film that you probably don't realize is set at christmas red dawn the 1984 invasion of america by people from nuke havistan movie uh, which is uh, considerably better than the appalling Chris Pine 2009 Red Dawn. This is again written by John Milius uh, who is well known for being fairly right wing if that's how your politics fall and um, this is a film about a plucky bunch of teenagers played by the Brat Pack specifically Patrick Swayze, C. Thomas Howell, Lee Thompson, uh, Ben Johnson, whoever he is, Charlie Sheen, Jennifer Grey, uh, featuring appearances by the great Harry Dean Stanton and Powers Booth, by the way, uh, directed and written by John Milius, who wrote, um, John Milius, by the way, also wrote uh, the Dirty Harry movies and uh, Conan the Barbarian and probably a lot of other movies in which America, yeehaw, is brilliant and the Ruskies are terrible. Um, but uh, it's a, a really, not fun, 
but it's a strange film about a bunch of teenagers who formed their own resistance against a Russian invasion of America in 1984. And um, that's, it's set in Christmas, amongst other things, uh, which you may not necessarily realise. Is it good? No. Is it fun? Not always. Do I like it? Inexplicably, yes. I don't quite know why. Oh dear, what else are we going to watch over Christmas that isn't Jingle All The Way? Well, you could have the uh, fabulous Rocky IV. Uh, also, here is a soundtrack album. And here is my, uh, my mega super duper Rocky box set with Rocky IV. I, I recommend, by the way, there are two cuts of the film. There's the uh, original 1986 Yeehaw version and the uh, slightly more sober 2019 cut of it, which is, uh, I think, currently on Amazon Prime, which is better, longer, and uh, hasn't had a disc release, which is a little strange. Uh, but Rocky IV has had its main title fight between Rocky and Ivan Drago on Christmas Day, 1985. So this is a Christmas film. Egads, who thought that was going to be coming? I didn't. Uh, but then I Googled it and I was, yes, it was set at Christmas. So Santa, all I want for Christmas is Rocky to win the fight against the Russians. There you are. Uh, it has, of course, a montage, one of the best montages in cinematic history, which I think is soundtracked by, oh, a track called Training Montage by Vince DiCola and a bunch of anonymous, generic 80s session musicians, uh, including, oh my word, uh, Burning Heart. And this is by Survivor. Oh, and loads of other people I've never heard of. Well, mm, okay. And James Brown's Living in America, which is the only song of this album, by the way, that I have seen live. I saw James Brown live in the year 2000, and that was a strange experience on the grounds that he was old and he was tired, and he spent a lot of his time either walking off the stage or walking on the stage while his hype man went, here we come, soul is, king of soul, James Brown, give it up, here he comes, and then James Brown kind of goes, <clears throat> and then he walks off, and then he goes, there he was, James Brown, king of soul, and it was like, okay, man, well, all right, but um, yeah, not, not impressive. It's fair to say. Uh, as someone says, that, uh, to the living you owe respect and to the dead only the truth. So there you have it. And James Brown was, of course, a notoriously horrible human being to some people uh, who disowned his children and uh, generally put it about like a shitter with a pout as Swade sang in Killing of a Flash Boy. So Rocky IV, that's a Christmas movie for you. That'll cheer up your, uh, your cold, dead insides. Other Christmas movies. Now we've got four. Four from 1987, and these are quite exciting little choices. Um, all films that I have feelings about, um, to various degrees, some more than others. Um, I'll save the best till last. The first one, Lethal Weapon Number One, starring Mel Gibson and uh, Donald Glover. Uh, and the, it's set at Christmas because it's written by Shane Black, because of course it is. And uh, Lethal Weapon number one is a pretty strange, oh God, pretty strange movie. Um, it's a, a bizarre, but it pretty much birthed the buddy, buddy cop genre after Freebie and the Bean killed buddy cop genres in 1974. Um, and uh, it, it just kind of rolls along. Uh, like a, a movie about, well, a bunch of people doing a bunch of things, solving a bunch of crimes, tracking down the baddies. And um, Murtar, uh, played by uh, Mel Gibson, before he became awful, um, is uh, both suicidal and depressed following the death of his wife. Donald Glover spends most of his time telling people he is too old for this shit. And there's Christmas trees all over the place. Is it good? Mm. It's an 80s action movie. So yes and no at the same time. But I should warn you, Lethal Weapon has a high concentration of both pointless saxophone and Eric Clapton in a built-up area, which could be detrimental to your health. You have been warned. The, uh, the, the second film from 1987, set at Christmas again, is, and I have to check the date on this, 1987, Robert Downey Jr. in the film of Less Than Zero based upon the novel by Brett Easton Ellis. When I was much younger, I quite liked Brett Easton Ellis's books. I have now grown up. I don't feel like that. This film was set at Christmas. And it is, again, as tale of a Beverly Hills brat who has it all and uh, then kind of loses it by eventually just being a bit of an asshole, taking loads of drugs and pissing everybody off. It's not a great movie, 
other films are available and they are much, much better. Or, depending on your point of view, much worse. Now, the best film I'm going to mention of most of these is a film by one of my favourite directors, Stanley Kubrick, 1987's Full Metal Jacket. I have the DVD, I have the Blu-ray, I have the book, I have the 12-inch, I have the soundtrack LP. I've chosen the soundtrack LP because the uh, Blu-ray is in a box set that just has a cover art disc. This is uh, the, uh, the Record Store Day green vinyl version of the soundtrack. Yes, you can touch that if you want, but you have to come around to my house and pay me a lot of money in order to do so. And uh, Full Metal Jacket is, and I might do a, bunch, a thing about uh, Vietnam movies at some point, Full Metal Jacket is a Christmas film. You might not think it, but do you remember the scene where they all sing around, well, they all walk around the, uh, the, the interior of it, uh, marching and singing, happy birthday, dear Jesus, happy birthday to you. That's Christmas, you might have heard of it, but that's what Christmas is all about. It's not about getting presents, getting fat, and watching the new episode of Doctor Who. It's a time for reflection, and watching Full Metal Jacket, and thinking about the birth of the beautiful baby Jesus. I am not religious, however, um, I uh, do on occasion uh, mention God when I'm in desperate need of something it doesn't always turn out. Full Metal Jacket is a Christmas film. Oh yeah, you might not think it. It is, but it is. So there you go. Obviously, Santa does not appear on his sleigh in that movie. So, two more to go. One from 1987 and one because I'm cheating from 1990. But this one I'm going to mention because you will not believe it's set at Christmas. Yes, I am coming out and telling you that this film, Jaws the Revenge, is a Christmas movie. My bloody God. Can you believe it? It's appalling. It's one of the worst films ever made. It's just atrocious in every way. It's enjoyable, but it's not good at all. It's a, a film that if it hasn't been on the podcast called How Did This Get Made, bloody well should have been. Uh, and it also closes and I can't believe they ended the, the Jaws movies with this line. Did I ever tell you about the time I flew 100 nuns to Nairobi? What the hell were they thinking? It's atrocious. Michael Caine is the best thing in it, and he's still pretty bad. So Jaws of Revenge is set in, in Hawaii. It's set in Christmas. It's got the family Brody, um, who are reprising their roles. Uh, as she is now widowed, followed the death due to contractual reasons uh, by Roy Schneider. And she is grief-stricken and travels to the Bahamas where she meets a carefree airplane pilot called Michael Caine. However, what she doesn't know, and this is only revealed in the novelization of Jaws, the, the Revenge, is that there is a special voodoo-powered shark. That's right, a voodoo guy has put a curse on the Brodies and the shark has been uh, implemented to enact that voodoo curse and then goes through and then chases the Brodies around to get revenge for the death of his brother in Jaws 1, 2 and 3. Or sisters, I don't know. They could be lady sharks. I don't know, I haven't looked. Jaws the Revenge, revenge is a bag of shit. It's one of the very worst films ever made. I cannot believe, honestly, I did. I cannot believe that I paid to see this film on a Wednesday at the Birmingham Odeon. I paid £3.50 and I wanted my money back. It was atrociously bad. It was one of the very worst films I've seen in the cinema. And had £3.50 not been half of my pocket money at that point, I would probably have walked out if I had one of those all-you-can-watch unlimited cards. I definitely would have walked out. But I'd spent the money, I'd got the 45 bus or the train into uh, town. I paid my £3.50 to see it on student night, and it was awful. I couldn't believe how bad it was. I genuinely couldn't. I'd be like... Oh my God, I wish they'd um, kind of, what's the word I'm thinking of here? I'd wish that they'd, they'd just kind of Lucas to this out of existence. Uh, but at which point people will be talking about it in hushed tones go, did you know there was a Jaws movie with Michael Caine that was set at Christmas and it involved a shark that had been subject to a voodoo curse that had to, and people would go, you, I can't believe it, that sounds awful. Nobody would ever think that would be a good idea. No, I don't think the people at the time thought it was a good idea. It definitely wasn't. It's one of the worst films I've ever seen. And, by the way, I have seen My Cousin Vinny. So um, I do know what the heck fire I am talking about. Last Christmas movie, again, cheating slightly, uh, but this because this was shot in 1989, but released in 1990, Exorcist 3, Legion, by William Peter Blatty. Uh, I talked about the Exorcist movies at uh, Halloween, 
when Exorcist Believer came out. Um, Exorcist 3 is set at Christmas. You might not think it, but it is. Uh, and it's a fine horror movie. It's uh, either one or two on my list of, of Exorcist movies, depending on what day of the week it is and how hungry I am. But it's a very, very good horror movie that just happens to be set at Christmas. It is really, really quite something indeed. But what I'm also going to mention, and last but definitely not least, is my favourite Christmas movie, which may surprise you. And because I don't have a copy of it physically, it means that I have to go and show it you on an iPad. Which, when I find the iPad, I'll show it to you. I'll be back in a second. Right, I'm back. So, I don't have this on disc, which means I'm not going to show you the disc of it. But my favourite Christmas movie, and this will surprise you, is... Arnold Schwarzenegger's Jingle All The Way. I think it's a fabulous movie. Is it good? No. Is it enjoyable? Completely and utterly. Jingle All The Way is my favourite Christmas movie for three reasons. Firstly, it's got Phil Hartman in, God rest his soul, who was always good in absolutely everything. He never, he always stole the scenes of everything he was in. Secondly, uh, it, Jingle All The Way is a fabulous parody of a action movie. Now, I say a fabulous parody of an action movie, you might not realise it. It's about a man who's in the search for a Turbo Man doll, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is prepared to tear his town apart to find it. Now, normally, you get it's a sly parody, uh, and deeply funny, actually, with very low stakes. So you think about some films, uh, which are always about the search for what Hitchcock called the MacGuffin, the thing that you need. Man with the Golden Gun, search for the Sol Solex Agitator, whatever that is, uh, Indiana Jones, uh, and The Last Crusade is a search for the Holy Grail. Raiders of the Lost Ark is a search for the Lost Ark of the Covenant. Um, yeah, all these films are about searches for this magical item, like the Maltese Falcon. Jingle All The Way takes all of those cliches that you get in an action movie, and it changes the stakes completely. Instead of it being the future of civilization, it's his son gets a Turbo Man doll. Instead of it being going to, let's say, through the desert, or, or through Mount Rushmore, or anything like that, What's the, what's the stakes? It's a series of department stores and it's a series of public transport events um, and it's got Arnold Schwarzenegger racing through a town to try and find a child's toy. I love it. It's brilliant. It's funny. It's one of my favourite Christmas films. In fact, it is my favourite Christmas film with Jingle All The Way. And I don't own it on disc. I only ever want to watch it at Christmas and it's on Channel 5 on a pretty much weekly basis during Christmas anyway. It's been on at least twice so far this Christmas, so I see no point in buying it. And besides, it's probably only 50p from CEX anyway, if you ever want to buy it. Uh, so Jingle All The Way is my favourite Christmas movie. That's a set of recommendations about obscure Aces films set at Christmas in case you want to watch Christmas films, but aren't really feeling the need to watch Santa Claus the movie or Deck the Halls or uh, anything like that. And um, there you are. So uh, have a happy Christmas, a Merry New Year, and I will see you all soon. Uh, I'm off to go and uh, eat some chocolate now, some uh, some lovely, tasty Christmas chocolate, because that's how Christmas works, isn't it? You sit there and you kind of eat chocolate and you feel a bit fat and you end up at a certain point going, you boy, what day is bins? And it's like someone goes, oh, it's tonight. And you're like, oh shit, I better do it. My favourite period of Christmas is where you forget what day of the week it is, what the time is, and you only know it's time to get up when the cat sits on you and meows because he wants to go out and either do a wee or eat some food. That's my idea of a good Christmas well lived. So um, have a wonderful Christmas and I will hopefully uh, see you either in person or in the comments section soon. Ho, ho, ho. Now I have a knock cast. See you all later, okay? Bye.